Every year, Startup Grind hosts our SG Women Leaders Month, proudly recognizing the accomplishments of successful women leaders all over the world. These women are founders, venture capitalists, engineers, executives, educators, and more who represent our community all around the world. This month's SG Women Month is proudly presented by Google for Startups and Silicon Valley Bank. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our event tonight, Coping with Crisis, the Women in Tech panel. Um, because SG is celebrating in June, the Women's Month, and I'm here with three inspiring women that are going to talk about uh, how they cope with crisis and how they succeed. Uh, I want to introduce you to our panelists. First of all, we have Emily Cleary. She's a UX designer a speaker, entrepreneur, and entertainer, a singer to be specific. She found her company, Clerico, and specializes in research and development, especially UX strategy and design, content creation, and teaching. She has a bachelor in business administration and sociology, both from Florida Atlantic University. She is also a graduate from Iron Hat Intensive UX and UI Design Academy. Second, we have Max Tuckman, the CEO and co-founder of Caribou, an interactive video calling platform that helps kids to have virtual play dates with family and friends when they can be physical together. Max is one of the Inc. Magazine top 100 female founders in 2019. She is also the 59th Latina in the U.S. to raise over $1 million in venture funding and the first Latina founder to raise $1 million in equity club funding. Uh, Pia Ramos, she is an entrepreneur, founder, and CEO of DeedBlocks, a multi-market software consolidating data and processes needed to analyze risk in real estate investment. Uh, her idea came out of Singular University, where she went to GSP incubator and accelerator. Uh, she is an architect uh, with a real estate, with a master in real estate development. Thank you all for being here. So I'm gonna put out the first question um, around the topic of COVID-19 and what crisis we are facing now as a society, no, not only as a woman, but what fears did you face when quarantine impact your city? So we know that in January, December, January, we were talking about the virus that was happening in China. And some of us say like, no, that's not gonna come here. Never, this is not gonna happen. But then in March hit us and we are like, okay, so did you prepare? Did you not? What happened the day you said like, okay, this is gonna change a lot of what we uh, know for that time. Um, we're gonna start with Emily. Okay. Um, first, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Honored to sit next to these uh, very inspirational women. Um, so as I was explaining a little before, if anyone caught it, so what changed the most for me was that I was working a full-time job and um, I was let go from the job due to COVID-19. And the way they let me go was so, and not just me, it was several people. Um, I felt it was so unprofessional. Like it was an email at 10 p.m. at night. And then by the next day they were like, you know, we can't, we couldn't do it in any other way. I was like, okay. Mm. That's the point. Um, so the biggest thing for me, I think the biggest fear for me in regards to COVID was um, my certain members of my family being higher at risk. Um, just I'm, I'm not too upset with having to be home. Um, I can be very productive when I'm by myself. But my biggest fear for me was when I lost the job, um, it was coming into my own, I think. It was like, well, what am I going to do? Um, you know, I know I can hustle. I know I can make money. However, you know, I'll be fine with that. But like, what am I going to do now? Because I don't have that distraction anymore. Right. Um, that was my biggest thing for me, I think. And just wondering what the world would turn into. I also lost all my, so I'm a musician. As you said, I'm a singer. I have a band. I have an EP, um, lost all the gigs that we had booked. 
And I was more, I think, nervous on that end of things, like what's going, and still, what's going to happen to the music industry? Um, a lot of places now are not booking full bands, they just book duos, trios, um, the live shows, there's not gonna be any big concerts or anything like that. So I'm wondering how the shift, uh, what the shift will be like in, in the music industry. Hmm. Um, Max or Olivia, do you wanna add something about what, what was your story around those days? I always love going last, so I'll let Olivia go if she wants. All right, I'll let you go last. <laughs> uh, so I, um, I was very paranoid from December, so I actually started preparing and hoarding everything that I thought I needed to survive. Um, and I started preparing the team to work remotely, which was something that we'd never done before. So we began for about a month, we worked Uh, we had all the protocols to work remotely in the office so that we were still there to figure out, you know, how things would work and tweak and, and understand. So, you know, moving remotely and we found out that the office we were working on was closing on the same day that we had to move out. But we were all ready. Uh, thank goodness, because uh, it was a very smooth transition. We took our desk homes. We've been working from home since then. And uh, and we've been very blessed to you know, to have had that, that transition. And uh, we all love working from home. I don't think we're going back to the office. Uh, we're very productive. I get to, you know, do a bunch of stuff at home and uh, that I, you know, things that I did. Never mind. Just, I can't, I don't have to drive anywhere, which is a blessing in Miami. And in terms of um, our business, what was really interesting is that For a long time, it was a very bullish market. Everybody was really focused on making a lot of money. We're in the, in the, in the industry of real estate. And since everything kind of stopped, people were, had time to listen to us. And we had 10 times as many conversations with customers and really accelerated our product market fit and our ability to understand who our customer really is. So now we're like totally moving that direction. Um, it's attracting investment. So There's been a really positive shift in the world pausing uh, for us as a business. Um, you, know, with, you know, that's without mentioning, of course, everything that's going on and all the you know, negative and unfortunate things that are happening. Um, there are, you know, you know, it's very extreme. There's some really great things that are happening and really horrible things that are happening. And, and it's hard to sort of understand where you fit in in you know on those two things you don't want you, know, you don't want the bad things to be happening but long story short yeah we we did okay we we're doing okay and the pause of the world was uh, a positive thing for us as a business yeah um i uh, i don't know if you remember olivia but we were in the uh 500 startup session and i was like talking about the pandemic as part of my marketing plan because i knew that this was coming we were i think it was in february that we were together or early march and it's like i we saw it coming too and we also are uh you know we're a video calling platform that makes families feel like they're together in a virtual play date through a video call so for us as distraught as we were about just kind of what the world was going to possibly look like and and um how unfortunate uh the impact of the pandemic was going to be we also knew uh that we would be able to respond and to help and i think the number one priority for families in covid is to stay safe but the number two priority is to stay sane And especially with little kids, especially with parents working from home and having kids out of school, uh, we saw it coming, right? I mean, it started in South Korea and then China and in, um, in Italy and a couple of other countries that, you know, the, by the time it got to us on March 14th, almost a billion kids were out of school across the world. And especially as an app that's on Android and iOS, for us, it was very easy um, to be bringing on global customers throughout kind of the beginning Um, of the pandemic. And we've always been a global company. We have users, we used to have users in only 160 countries. Now they're in over 200 countries. And um, so the pandemic, you know, again, as unfortunate as it is, uh, has has done lots of wonders for Caribou. And, and again, I'm not upset that we're doing well in a pandemic because again, we are helping families, right? We are keeping families connected. I think 
one of the things that is really magical about caribou is a lot of glamas are on caribou. So those are glamorous grandmas. In Spanish, it's fabuelas, abuelas fabulosas. And grandparents need a better video call with their grandchildren, and they need activities to do in a video call. If anyone uh, on the panel or in the audience has a child who is zero to seven, you know that a FaceTime call with anybody and that child is just a, a disaster. Um, so our video call comes with an in-app library of books and activities. And so as kids were stuck at home, you know, kind of in, in e-learning or homeschool or whatever kind of version that they had, they still had an opportunity to have a virtual play date with Glamma uh, or one of their little friends from kindergarten. They were able to actually read a book together or do a game or, or, um, or do an activity uh, like a word search in the video call. Um, so we, we saw explosive growth um, because of the pandemic. So as, as upsetting as it was to see kind of what it was going to do um, uh, to just to, you know, civilization in general um, and how uh, bad it was going to be, we knew that we could step in and help. Nice. Uh, it's very interesting because the three of you, even though it's the same city, the same region, we are all in South Florida. You have a very different uh, perspective of what has happened. And it's, it's very inspiring to hear that you took that uh, like wave on the top and see like let's play this good for us so so you grow your company you have your opportunity you see where where this path will lead you in the future and my next question to you more like uh, taking out the hat of a CEO or co-founder of a huge company what were what were your challenge as an entrepreneur as a human being like okay this takes me a little bit out of my comfort zone. So what were your uh, coping mechanisms and, and how did you remain productive? Uh, we can uh, go in a different way. So we're gonna start with Olivia this time. I am muted, there you go. Uh, so uh, for me personally, on a personal level, I remember when it hit Miami, I had been ready for so long, but I just freaked out. Like I, like once it hit Miami, I was like, I couldn't move my face. I was like in shock. And the way that I uh, walked through that um, is I have a strong practice of meditation and prayer and, 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 um, and yoga and service. And, and so for me, like really getting deep into that, helping other people, um, meditating and, and trusting that everything was in divine order was something that for me was super important to get me through the, the craziness that could otherwise happen in my mind. Uh, the, the itty bitty shitty committee that could happen in my mind to like tell me that everything's over, that things are gonna, like I didn't need any of that. So I tried to keep my mind very positive. I tried to trust that things were changing for a reason and and through a very strong daily practice of meditation prayer and yoga uh, i feel pretty good um, and that practice just continues to increase because the craziness doesn't seem to be over yet in fact it's getting a little bit more complex and so uh it's important to stay sane through through this time yeah, and you being in a in a right uh, peace of mind makes your company grow and stay organized because you are the master of your company and has to put everything in place, right? Yeah, I think as a leader, uh, if you're freaking out, everybody else starts freaking out. So the the more that you can bring stability and and hope and and optimism, uh, the better your team you know can deal with their fears. And but you know my entire team, they're they're like you know, we're all like wild, wild west and they can, they can, they have their own practices and they do their own thing. So I'm, I've adopted a lot of the practices from my teammates, actually two of our, one of our engineers does like a three minute exercise every hour. And now I'm doing that and it totally keeps me really calm and serene. So we're, we're helping each other and communicating different practices that, that can help. And, and it's a team effort to keep everybody 
on board. And I've had times where my teammates have to be like, hey, you look a little down. Come on. Like, this is cool. Uh, we're going to get through this. So it's, uh, you know, it's a team effort to to keep that, you know, optimism up. Nice. What about you, you Max? I am never good at answering this question because I just, I am not a mindfulness person. I don't meditate. I don't even sleep. Um, literally my <laughs> water intake is from espresso. I, uh, I literally sleep three to four hours a night. Um, and then I sleep for 20 hours on Saturday. That's just my schedule. And I work 20 hours a day. I haven't left my house in three months because I don't want to get sick. Um, I, I can't listen to podcasts. I don't have any, I have an emotional support dog. That's, uh, but that doesn't work for everybody. If you are like me, it works. Um, but that is, that's not for everybody. But you, did you were like that when, before COVID or? I've always been like this. Yeah. yeah. I, okay. I just, so nothing um, changed. Yeah. Nothing changed and like nothing about, I think what I will say is Sunday, I kind of lost my shit. Um, because I just think when you, when you have my schedule, when you just, when you don't deal with things, right. When you just work, 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 and just drink coffee and work, work, work and not sleep. And then, and then Sunday you see your friends in so much pain and you can't do anything about it and you are at home and you can't even physically give them, you know, just even a hug. Um, and you can't, and you just can't gather in a safe way. Like I just, I, I think that is probably like the one place where um, I feel like I, I didn't have a coping mechanism for that. So I just kind of like lost it on Sunday. And then I was like, all right, let's get to work. Let's like do more on anti-racism and caribou. Let's like, that's, that's where I, I, my coping mechanism is to like, just jump into action. I just, I am, I am more healthy when I'm doing. If yeah. I stop and think, then I get like, <laughs> yeah, you can freak out. Uh, what about you, Emily? Yeah, so I'm uh, quite similar to Olivia. So I am a Reiki practitioner. Um, I, you know, I practice that every day on myself as well with as well as meditation. Um, I also do yoga. I work out six days a week. So I made sure that I was really on my at home fitness grind. Um, that really keeps me sane. Uh, fitness is very important to me. You've heard my my weight loss story already, Vanessa. So. I have to, you know, make sure that I, I maintain that. Um, also, just having outlets. So for me, it's communication, a communication outlet and a creative outlet. So as far as, you know, I wasn't able to see a lot of people uh, at first. And um, it was just about strengthening my relationships with my friends, with my family, being able to communicate with them when I'm having a bad day or when I'm, you know, I was mostly, I'm mostly in good spirits. I'm a very peaceful person. I have a lot of inner peace. I found that, um, you know, last year. Otherwise, it's, it's really important to be able to express how you're feeling to others and, you know, have them empathize with you and, and have them say the right things to you so you can get out of that headspace. And for me, the other outlet is creativity. So I have a, a home studio. I found different projects I can work on, working with different musicians and things like that, um, writing different things to make sure that I can, you know, keep on my cues and cues with that. Uh, it's very important to me. So um, those are basically my, you know, my ways of, of changing or of just being, I think that in general, um, I don't know if I was so scared about coronavirus coming. I mean, I knew it was coming. I feel like it hit Miami later than I thought it would. Um, it didn't really get real for me until all my gigs got canceled. Um, because the Friday, before, I think it was like March, what, March 14th was what, a Saturday? Because yeah. I had I had a gig March 13th and it wasn't canceled. So I was like, all right, what's really going on? And it was, um, it was a private gig. And I mean, it was the last one that I did because then everything got canceled. Um, so to me, that's when it really hit. And that's when I was like, okay, I need to get food. I need to get whatever I can find. Um, and you know, by that point there was no hand sanitizer. There was nothing left, no toilet paper or anything. So it was just like, okay, well I'll find it when I can get it. And just have to, you know, hunker down early this year. So you didn't need to text Olivia because apparently she's got a bunker full of toilet paper and Purell. That's where all the Purell and Lysol in Miami is. Not anymore. Not anymore. It's, it's been three months. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, our next question it comes around the the topic um, of women in tech. Our uh, the title of this panel was "Women in Tech Coping with Crisis." So. 
uh, what's your um, your thoughts about our position uh, as a woman now in this industry, like making changes and how this crisis as as the as for you, um, uh, Max and Olivia, that help you to be in another stage that wouldn't come that uh, fast if if it wasn't for the crisis. So, do you think uh, this COVID crisis will help us? as a woman to, to take more place in the industry or to do more changes faster that we will normally do if, if the world was as the same as last year? Um, Emily? It's possible. It, it's possible because I feel like this, uh, this crisis has accelerated everything that's supposed to happen uh, and in very uncomfortable ways, uh, but it's bringing up like, truths are like bubbling up and coming up and and there and i think there's opportunity in that so and there's also you know most markets are a complete standstill so which is an, 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 a really incredible oppor a moment of innovation and change if you look at the crash from 2008 tons two dogs in here just happened to like there's just photo bomb here yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. And now they decided to like fight, which is very, very opportunistic. Okay, so I'll, I'll make it very quick. But, but the idea is there's a lot of opportunity for change. If you look at all the change that happened in 20, 2008, it was Venmo, Airbnb, um, all these like virtual things happened in 2008 that we didn't realize. Uh, and it just kind of crept up. The same thing's going to happen now. And these are, there's, there's room for opportunity. Women certainly have. Uh, uh, a great position to to do it just as well as men. I don't I don't see a difference uh, right now in terms of the opportunities that are out there because a lot of industry needs a lot of answers and that goes across every single spectrum. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a good it's a good time to do something, you know, whatever that is. I'm learning how to code just because, you know, I think it's a good opportunity to do something else, you know, to to learn something new. So. Yeah, I think um, I like. I'm actually very excited about the gains that I think women are going to be able to make when we've now leveled the playing field, right? Like, imagine all the back door meetings that would happen at strip clubs and golf clubs and country clubs and all this other crap where men would, you know, talk to each other and make deals and get to, you know, get these deeper relationships that women were always shut out of, and especially with Me Too and Times Up male investors stopped meeting with us one-on-one, -on -one, right? We couldn't just go to the bar and meet up because they were so terrified that something was going to happen because they were just bad people or they were so terrified that the perception that something would happen. So the fact that we now all just have to meet on Zoom calls is awesome because I know some mediocre white male or some dude is not getting more attention than I am or getting more airtime or more networking. Um, that person is, what was actually really funny, where was I earlier today? Oh, I was, um, we're in the Goldman Sachs cohort and the CEO of Goldman Sachs like came and talked. It's black and Latinx founders. Like it's so freaking amazing. Like I took a screenshot of all of our little screens because I was like, I've never been in a room with this many like founders of color. It's so awesome. But the CEO of Goldman Sachs comes on and he zooms in. He talks to us. He answers some questions and he zooms out. So none of the dudes could like run over to him and be like, hey, what's up? Can I get a card? Let me give you my card. Let me talk to you. And, like we all had equal opportunity there, which was, I mean, maybe they'll do it later and maybe I'll do it later. But like it's, it's a very different physical space. Um, and I think women are, are going to, to win in this. And then the second thing I'll say is, again, as a woman who, uh, you know, has to go out and raise money, I love the fact that I can't get physically sexually harassed anymore, right? And that I'm not asked to meet someone in their apartment to raise money, right? Like you, they are in their apartment, but I'm in my apartment and they feel like there's no safety issue. Um, so I think there are some benefits that I think are going to help women um, in given the context of what's happening. Yeah, I think those are great points, Max um, and Olivia. I think that in general, um, this is definitely a time and space to learn new things. Uh, so for example, I picked up new instrument, I'm learning more about NLP, you know, things that I want to 
put into my courses that I'm creating. Um, NLP is neuro linguistic uh, practitioner or programming. It's about you know language and how it works in your head. Life coaching, things of that nature. I'm really into self development, personal development, um, and also what else I wanted to say. Um, I completely forgot, of course. Um, <laughs> so it's not, I do that all the time. And the, and, <laughs> like I and, two things, can't remember the second one, sorry. Yeah, you know, it's just about, you know, how, how women will, will be improving and, oh, so what I wanted to say is maybe it's not so, it's not directly related to COVID, but it's more about what's happening now, I think, with the protests. Um, I think that we will see, and I hope that we will see a lot more female leaders in politics. Um, and in all of those, you know, spaces where we need different viewpoints um, as to how laws and policies are created. So I think that, you know, because it's sort of connected with the times right now, um, I hope that we will we'll see a change in that space as well with uh, females. And I think that tech has a lot to do with it because a lot of uh, different businesses, for example, when I was reading about how restaurants are going to be opening up in the phases, um, you're not allowed to have like the, the receipt, the checkbook, you can't pass it. You know, you have to, you have to pay on an app. So now there's so many different companies Finally. and restaurants, right. That will be using that technology um, to pay for things. And, you know, there's no more paper and, and things like that. So there's a lot of opportunity there for founders of any, you know, color of any gender or sex to create those solutions. Nice. Yeah, I totally agree with, with everything that you said. Like Max throws some really thoughtful things around that. I, I, last week we had an event uh, where um, we were talking about raising money and now people had to raise money through LinkedIn or email. So, so I think that's a great opportunity for, for female founders to, to close the bridge between like doing it in person because it sometimes is awkward or or it's a an ex stigma around what women can do or not in in that kind of uh, world so our other question um is um well how did you overcome this stigma that is around um women in tech um, and yeah your story or if you have any story around it like how did you succeed over, I don't know, your male competition and any thoughts for, for our listeners that are here that want to uh, be a female founder that are encounter some problems through the, through the process and, and any thoughts around that? Yeah, I can, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it's just about being confident uh, in who you are and in your knowledge and in your experience and standing up for yourself. So don't let ever don't ever let anyone, you know, bullshit you or talk to you uh, in a negative way or talk down to you or things like that. Um, I'm someone who is really not afraid to be assertive. I try not to be aggressive because I'm a, I'm a peaceful person, but um, I will assert my my position and my stance and I will stand up for it. Um, there's been many times, you know, in different roles that I've had where I was challenged by a, a male who was in a manage, management position uh, higher than, than I was, right? And I remember we were specifically talking about, um, we were in a meeting, we were specifically talking about, I think it was when NCAA athletes were going to be funded by the, or they were going to get paid by, by the school in California. We were talking about that. And I had my reasons why I wasn't sure how I felt about it, right? It's not that I disagreed, but I was like, well, teachers don't get paid more and blah, 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 and all these things. I come, I taught at FAU and at Broward College, so I'm coming from that mindset. Um, and he was like, oh, that's your excuse? I was like, excuse me, that's not an excuse. It's a very valid reason. Were you a teacher? Like, you know, like, were you an instructor? Like, where's your position coming from? Oh, maybe you played football when you were young. Like, okay, but don't tell me that I'm making an excuse, you know, like, so it's not just sitting back. It's like, oh, well, yeah, that's my excuse. No, no, no. You have to, you know, be punchy about it. I'm from New York. Like, I'm not gonna, I don't play around, you know, <laughs> um, I'm not going to do anything bad, but you're not going to talk to me that way. So I think it's just about being really able to hold your ground, stand your ground and um, be able to negotiate. That's really important. Be able to ask for what you know you're worth 
um, and don't back down from that. Great. That's, that's a, a really nice thought for people that sometimes don't feel confident about them, themselves and, and let other people to tell them what to do. And that's one really important uh, thing that uh, us as women had to overcome when we decide to go uh, to be entrepreneurs and call ourselves entrepreneurs. We, we cannot uh, have this space to, to let people tell us what to do. I don't know if Olivia or Max has anything to add to this point. Um, just a quick one. I actually, I missed the question, but from the, because I was switching headphones, I, I keep running out of batteries. I have to have two. Um, so, um, from the answer, from Emily's answer, I think I, I will add that something that I've learned in, in collaborating with very strong male personalities, um, is, you know, sometimes it's not, it has nothing to do with you and it's like their issue. So learning how to navigate that and still be heard in, in a calm way and not allow some like strong personality to trigger, uh, you know, like Emily said, not, you know, not be reactive, but just respond to the situation and stay calm and think about it and pause and have some time to think about it. It's really helpful. And, and what I've, when I've been challenged with, with like very large male, strong personalities that everything I said was like, why are you getting so emotional? And, you know, like, passion and emotion kind of like uh, was like thrown around um, against me. Um, at some point, I just have to be like, man, it's not my fault that this guy is, you know, or it could be a woman, like this person, you know, has issues and they need to, you know, exert their power by putting other people down. That has nothing to do with me. And I can still have a valid point and I can still get my ideas across and get what I want without getting into this like emotional turmoil. So I guess just being aware of what you're confronting uh, and, and being strategic about how to deal with people that are just like nasty, uh, you know, it's something to, to really grow inside, like, you know, what is really going on? So that's, that was my experience. I think they covered it. <laughs> okay. Um, are putting, you sure? <laughs> putting, uh, we back asking, um, sorry, Vanessa, just, yeah, you know, sure. Olivia was saying so it's basically kind of exactly what she was saying but the mindset that really helped me is that you have to understand that people act out of their own maturity level experience and consciousness level so it's like you just accept them for what they're giving you it's like okay that's how they know how to act and I can control how I react so that's you know how I try to think in situations as well okay um putting us back the head of a founder or or um entrepreneur or what you're gonna do next uh what are your thoughts and plans um after covid or or what is gonna be our new normal because i don't i don't believe that we are going going back to what it was before so what is your plan or or just strategies on your company or, or you as entrepreneur that you can tell us or share with us that we can follow and see what's our what is your mind around this new normal? Um, I'll go so you guys can continue to think about your answers. Uh, so for me, it's, it's being really agile and speaking to my customers uh, because like the, what we discovered during this COVID crisis, like we had no idea that that was our real customer. And it started at that accelerator with Richard, uh, but, but it really was after listening to a lot of people and speaking to the customers and doing a lot of research and not having like a strict, uh, a rigid plan moving forward and expecting to know what's going to happen, but really being flexible and taking in as much information as possible to make the right decisions. And just to, to answer uh, Ricardo's uh, question on meditation and how it helps me with my ideas, like this is, <laughs> this is going to sound funky, but like every single decision that I make comes from meditation and you could ask the team, and I'm very open about it. Oh, this just came from meditation. And meditation gives me, maybe it's just in a, you know, sometimes people that happens in the shower because the shower is a moment where your brain relaxes. So meditation for me is a moment where my brain relaxes and maybe things settle and I'm able to see which idea makes most sense and what resonates with me more. Um, 
I'm not saying I necessarily have an antenna to some kind of uh, other source. I hope I do uh, because my mind is very small compared to what could be out there. But that's a completely different conversation. The point is uh, being really <laughs> aware of what's going on and giving yourself time to think about it or to settle uh, before making any decisions. Like be less reactive and more um, absorbing of what's going on and then responsive about what to do next and be very open that that could be something that you're not imagining at all. That would be do you, right. Do you think this new normal will have less fossil, 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 grinding, 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 and more like, okay, we can stop, we can breathe, and, and then we can come with some successful decisions or successful uh, companies and projects and ideas, but we are not coming from this mentality of fossil, fossil, fossil. No, I, 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 I wish that was the case. I, I think uh, the market is pushing really hard to go back to the hustle. The hustle makes a lot of people a lot of money. Um, and, you know, so if, if you want to have that mentality and you want to have that practice and you'll be going against the grain, because I think the market wants to get back to normal as soon as possible, whether that's going to happen or not is a completely different uh, proposition. Uh, that's just like my own personal, like, this is how I want to do it. But that doesn't mean I'm not hustling. It just means I'm taking some time to hustle in a more focused way. Of course. Max? I, I mean, everything we remember about the way that we used to do things is, is gone, right? I mean, um, we... And not to get, you know, like kind of in, in a depressing state, but like we are going through a global pandemic. Like literally everyone on this planet is being affected by something and we are being affected by something that is very psychologically traumatic. Um, and in the U.S. now we have two pandemics that are going on, right? So, um, and there is a group of people that is really severely being affected by the two pandemics in the U.S. And I remember there was a conversation I had with a friend who talked about the depression in the 1930s. And remember, that was just mainly in the U.S. It was, you know, kind of global, but it was mainly in the U.S. And everyone that went through that depression uh, there was this PTSD, right, afterwards. Everyone would kind of sew their coats. They wouldn't buy a new coat. They would fix the hole in their shoe. They wouldn't buy new shoes because they never knew if it would happen again. They were just always in anticipation of the fact that they would lose their jobs again, that there would be a global crash, that, you know, that they would, the economy would tank, that their friends would jump out of buildings. I mean, it was just so traumatic. And then if you look at the Holocaust in the 40s, um, and my grandparents went through this, I mean, till the day they died, they hoarded food because they never knew when it was gonna happen again that they were gonna starve um, and that they wouldn't have access to food and that at any moment they could be put in a cattle car and sent to a concentration camp, right? I mean, it was their reality, they had been through it. Um, and here we have literally just three months of a global pandemic that we know is going to last minimum 18 months until we have a vaccine. And we already in three months are, are scared to go outside that kids, right, are learning rules where you don't touch other people, you don't hug anymore, you don't, you not too many people in a room, don't get in an elevator with another person, no kisses, uh, stay six feet away, wear a mask, right? Like all of these things that are, and, and again, this is global, right? It's not just one group of people that are gonna go through this. So I think as we plan for the future, whatever company you run, uh, we have to think about the psychology of what is happening and the psychology of how people are going to react, even if, even when we can physically get close to people. Remember, we are we are teaching ourselves, we are forming a habit um, to be scared of being anywhere close to other humans for fear that they may give us something that could hurt us. Right. So, um, as consumers, as companies where we are thinking about consumers, at least for me, you know, we're B to C. I have to think about how consumers are going to react to that. And again, I have a product that was built for this, which is great. Um, but at the same time, like I also have to be thinking about the growth of the company and that's, um, and how are we going to uh, create opportunities for kids to be able to, to talk about this? I think that's a, something that we've been really excited about is because our, our app is uh, digital, we can get content that is super relevant to the conversation happening because 
as we've seen um, with Black Lives Matter, it's incredibly important that we're talking to kids about race and talking to kids about being anti-racist. But where are the books, right? Where are the books to have those conversations? Adults are already uncomfortable having this conversation with adults. Can you imagine with a child who's asking you questions or saying things that you're like, oh, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. Um, and the public libraries are closed right? And Barnes and Noble is gone. And, and you only have six books in your house. And like, how do you, so thinking about kind of how the consumer is going to react, where, where they're going to get their information, how they're going to purchase things, um, how they're going to be in physical space. I think those are the things we have to start anticipating and know that it's going to cycle, right? Like I think already for the next 18 months, we're, we're, we're in the first kind of cycle of it. Um, so what do the cycles look like? I'm thinking about for the next 18 months, what do the cycles look like? Uh, how do I prepare for the next cycle? Um, and then once the, vi you know, once the vaccine is here, what does the, the new world look like? Um, and it's hard to predict, but I think, I think we have to be, we have to be realistic with ourselves that, you know, we're not, we're not going back to what, it, and also even if we were to like go back to movie theaters, those physical structures will not even exist in, in two years because they will have been abandoned, right? right. Like, so just think it, again, not to go too dark, but I think we have to just think differently and you really have to push yourself to do it. You almost have to like, you almost have to like pretend you're an alien. This is, I remember I met a futurist. There was a woman who was like, I'm a futurist. And I was like, what the hell does that even mean? And she was like, I, think of myself as an alien and I say if I was an alien that just visited from Mars and I looked at the you know at the planet I would be like wow there's these cars that are, that drive everybody like the cars are the are the humans right like the way that she just thought about it when she like started blank slate I think that also will create a lot of creativity um in in new companies like Olivia was saying right in 2008 it, necessity is a mother of invention. When when you have nothing around you and you it sometimes hit rock bottom or the economy has tanked, you say, how do we get creative with people's open space, extra space, right? How, with their couches, like people need things and, and you start creating these marketplaces. Um, but sometimes you have to, and maybe for Olivia, I think that's awesome. Like the, the time where your brain can take a break, maybe that's when you can get creative and say, what is this going to look like in the future? So I agree that it's absolutely, you know, COVID has definitely taken a psychological toll on everyone. Um, and I think also sociologically, um, you know, everything is, is different now. The collective conscious is now sort of instilled with fear, right? Um, as Max was saying, you know, we're hoarding things and um, prices are spiking for certain items, you know, all the paper goods and things of that nature. Um, the stores are opening earlier for populations that may be more at risk. We don't have sports anymore. People are now questioning how important are sports because, you know, look at everything that's going on with the, the, the protesting right now and, and um, all of the, the pandemic that is racism. Um, there's a lot of things that are changing um, in our collective conscious. So I feel and I hope that people's mindsets will change to be more conscious towards, okay, what are we really focusing on? What do we really need? What's really important um, during this time that we have in this physical vessel, like in our bodies right now? Um, and I think that a lot of change will, will come. But for me personally, for my business, like I said, because I am my product right now, um, I am in this place of becoming. So I am just understanding and like, you know, what do I really want to focus on? What do I, I you know, I'm trusting myself. Um, like, what do I, what are my real passions? How can I really make a difference? Um, you know, for me, that's speaking, singing, and spirituality. That's, those are my three things, my three S's. Um, and so that's sort of, you know, just what I'm focusing on. And I'm focusing on creating my service based business, which is basically me or I have a partner with some projects. We provide the services. Um, we're still doing all the work, you know, so I'm working towards how do I make that passive income? How do I, um, you know, get a team together, you know, build it into an agency, uh, maybe create an accelerator where I'm mentoring students who are, you know, learning about UX or learning about whatever it is. Um, and, you know, I'm paying them to do work and, you know, I'm mentoring them and then they're getting connected with companies. Like, how can I um, do good for the community? Because that's what's important, you know, giving back. There's, there's so much importance um, in the art of giving, you know, I very much believe in law of attraction, things like that. 
um, you know, mentalities and, and things of that nature. So, I mean, that's what it is for me. And we'll see what it looks like in the next 18 months as things continue to change. But, you know, I know for sure, one thing I know is that, yeah, I mean, right now we're still in like, I don't know what this space is. It's not Corona, Corona BC, you know, it's not Corona AD either. So we're just like Corona right now. Um, but I won't be going back to the life that I was living before where I was just, you know, following the structure of what has been imposed upon me, um, you know, throughout the systems. So. And by the way, can we find a word for Corona? Like, because you're right. It is like pre COVID, pre COVID, like post COVID. And then I'm like, but what's, what is the word for living in COVID? <laughs> like my, my COVID, I don't know. <laughs> Coral <laughs> crisis. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, maybe it's just crisis. Yeah, pre-crisis, crisis, and then post-crisis. Maybe that's yeah. what I'll start using. Cause like, there's, yeah, it's not, yeah. it's not a, yeah. Maybe, maybe Corona was only our fir first crisis because as we are seeing now, like the protests and everything, uh, in in that political uh, panorama is going to have a huge impact also in into markets, into society, in what people think and. And one important uh, thought that I think all of you mentioned in your plans is it's the it's the giving back uh, feature that you're doing. Like even though you're planning for your for your company to build something great to to provide a product that is awesome for your customers, giving back is so something so important. And I think the crisis make it um, made it really really like in the top of the game like. If, if you're not giving back sometimes uh well now we are seeing like you are ir irrelevant like uh people that had uh, multi-million dollars and and now they face a, a crisis because they are not getting enough customers or for example cinemas like where where are you now so you have to start giving back and thinking about how you can uh, support your customers and your community that are facing a huge problem because sometimes we forget as an as an entrepreneurs that our customer, that the person that it's gonna buy our idea or is gonna purchase our item is also facing these problems. So so it's not only us in this bubble, it's everyone. So that's really important to have in mind. So Emily, we have a question for you. Um, how has your music background informed you your tech career? Seems like a lot of top, top programmers are in bands. Yeah, so um, I'm not a programmer, so I can't answer the programmer question. But as far as um, UX design and content writing, things like that, whatever I do in tech, um, it's the creativity. So it's the, so I am a songwriter. It's being able to translate songwritings, picking really specific words into UX writing, which will increase your conversions. Um, it's being able to design a flyer or cover art for a show or for a song that I'm releasing and translate that into, um, design for a web page or for an app, you know, things like that. There's very much, um, it flows all together. And for me, it just, it keeps me sane because if I'm just doing one uh, of, of them, then I'm just like, well, I need the other one. I need the other one. So um, I think that's how it's just the thinking. I think it's, I'm, I'm wondering, um, seems like a lot of top programmers are in bands. I'm like wondering about that. Um, I think for maybe programmers, so programming is a language, right? But so is music. Um, Programming is a universal language. Music is a universal language. And you don't even know how to, you don't have to know how to read music to figure it out, right? It's, you can do it by ear, but music transforms people. Music changes people. And so does tech. Uh, and I think that's where they really cross lines because it's, it's just another language. And, and I think that's, that's part of it for me too. It, it's a language, it's expression. Um, you can express yourself through UX design. You can express yourself through whatever you're programming because you can write it in so many different ways. It's just what works for you, what's clean, what's good code. Um, so I think that would be, I think that's my answer. Nice. Um, our last question, and then we're gonna uh, wrap it up with the Q and A if our uh, attendees has some. It's what's your metric now uh, for success or progress? So if you are in June two 2021, next year, and you say like, okay, I, 
I did a, a this amount of progress. I did this and did that. So do you have a metric now that you do you want to accomplish something during this time of of crisis uh, that you can share with us? And and what is that? And why is that important for you in your career? Uh, I would say my metric is very non-traditional. It's freedom. Um, so what I dislike so much about being in an office or working for a company that I didn't, you know, really care about the industry um, and I didn't love what I was doing is that I felt like I was a little bit trapped. Like I could be doing all these other things that I really wanted to do, but I was stuck. I mean, I, they were paying me, you know, like it was, it was an investor. That's how I thought of it. Um, but I was stuck there, right? I had to do things for them from nine to six and I could have spent that time doing something else, but I didn't trust myself. So now my, my metric in my, in my state of transformation and becoming is how can I balance being able to profit and pay my bills and have a, you know, a nice cushion while also having the freedom that I need to be an artist and be creative. Um, so right now that's what it is. And I think that'll always be a part of it for me. But I mean, at, at some point it will change once, you know, I have my courses created and, and things of that nature. So I'll get back to you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Let's do one next year. Yes. <laughs> Max, you want to go last? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that's a tough question. So, you know, metrics in, in a, like a, VC backed startup has to be revenue and growth uh, is something that we've committed to because we've had the blessings of people trusting their money into our company. And we're very grateful for that. And so in order to do that, though, there are metrics within that that are really important to us. And it's how relevant is our software to solve certain problems in terms of, uh, you know, the development of cities and the people who invest in them. And how powerful is our technology to be able to get people closer to the best decision? And, and, uh, and for us, it means a lot because one, we're building for a very high-end world, uh, the, the private equity world. Uh, but at the same time, we have a, we're going to have a free version in June that's going to be very powerful for smaller investors, architects, brokers. Uh, to tr transition what they're doing into a more collaborative, more autonomous way. Uh, so giving the architect the power of finance, giving the broker the power of zoning. Uh, and, and so that's something that really, we really believe in. Um, and all of it can be measured through number of users and, and revenue, because the more that, that we build and the more relevant it is, the more it should be adopted. Um, so we're going for that. Uh, we don't have a lot of options to, other than to go for that. Uh, and on a personal level, I, I totally agree with Emily, like this sense of freedom, a sense that I'm building what I believe in, uh, that I'm continuing to learn. I would love in a year from now to be very fluid in Python and be able to like make spiders that crawl on the internet and get all the information that I need to make decisions that I want to make. Uh, and uh, I have an intern right now. I have 16 interns right now, but one of them has this power and I am just completely, I just, I have to have it. And so I hope that I have the diligence and patience to, you know, come in an hour or two early every day. That's what I've been doing to learn Python. Uh, and so in continuing, you know, a practice of service, prayer, meditation, and stay sane. You know, that, that's a really good goal a year from now to remain sane, uh, especially with everything that's going on. And when you say 18 months max, I'm like, wow. That's not the timeline I had in mind. But you don't have enough toilet paper. <laughs> not for 18 months. Definitely not for 18 months. I know. I was like, damn, when hurricane season comes, I'm going to Olivia's house, but apparently not. Unless she's just hiding. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, yeah, I, I think back to Olivia's point when you're VC backed or when, when you've taken investor money, right? It doesn't even matter if it was angel money um, or friends and family money, which is actually, I think, more restrictive sometimes and stressful. Uh, you, I, what I realized, I, I, I thought I was like, oh, I'm going to do a startup. I'm not going to have a boss anymore. And then I was like, just kidding. <laughs> um, it's not only just my investors that are 
you know, sort of my boss in a way, but it's my customers that are my boss, right? My customers tell me what to do every day and they vote with their money um, and their pockets and they, they pay me monthly if they love what I do and they, they stop paying me, they stop paying me if they don't love it. And I've always been the type of person that has cared more about impact and more about like growing impact. And so I feel like in a year, if Caribou was successful, then we've grown our impact. We have helped more families. We, um, we already every day get so many messages, hundreds of messages of people who are tagging us on social or sending us emails or calling us just to say like how game changing Caribou has been for their family and for their kids and all the things that um, their kids are now opening up to or the things that their kids are doing now because of Caribou. So I, I want that to exponentially grow by next year. And um, I don't know if you guys noticed, but I don't really have any personal goals except for stay alive. Sleep Eat more. Yeah. <laughs> I'll sleep when I'm dead. Ain't got no plans oh for more sleep. <laughs> That, nope. that's a, that, that I think is a superpower. Like you have a really special superpower and if you can oh, live is. with that, no, I like, you're about awesome. All the time. I'm literally like a mutant from like a Marvel comic book. Like I use this superpower because I knew when I was in business school, I was like, I may not be as smart as everybody. I was like, I am actually pretty smart, but like, I was like, I will outwork everybody in this school. Like I just have way many more hours to be working on cases or taking on other things. It is a superpower. And when you have a superpower, you should use it. Yeah. For the for good. good. Yeah. Not for even right. Totally. Yes. <laughs> totally. Uh, we have a question from uh, Paola. She said, what advice can you give uh, for people working in tech that have to continuously reinvent themselves? Uh, obviously continuously learning, et cetera, et cetera. I will actually answer that first because I love that question. Um, you're the luckiest person alive if you get to constantly reinvent yourself. I don't think I would have ever been prepared to run a startup if I didn't have like 900 jobs by the, you know, from the age of 14. Like the only reason I feel prepared for anything at Caribou, which by the way, every morning I wake up and I'm unprepared for everything that comes at my face. But like the only reason why I feel like somewhat competent is because I'm like, oh, I did that in an internship like 16 years ago or like, oh, I had that job or like, I mean, I took on like crazy jobs. Nothing was ever beneath me because everything was a learning experience. And I think it's such a gift. I don't think uh, we we talk about this as much. And I think our, I'm, I'm like on the older end of this generation of like millennials who you know, switch jobs every two years. I look like my resume looks like I'm like running from the FBI, but I love it because I picked up skills that I would have never picked up in, in a traditional career or if I had stayed at one company or if I had always been corporate, if I had always been government, like I switched from government to private to nonprofit, to tech, to school, to volunteering, to art, to fashion design, to MTV. Like, I mean, I literally like, I just have more hours in my day. So I took on more jobs, but it, it was such a gift and I highly, highly recommend it. I think the more jobs and also the more jobs you take on, the more things you learn, you don't like. And I think that's even more important than knowing the things that you like, just knowing the functional things or the in, in industry. So I always say, when you look at your career, either pick industry or pick function. Right. So, um, for example, I've always been in the industry of education. I've always had a different function. So I've had a different kind of like functional role within education, but there are some people who are a lawyer and they don't care about the industry. Um, so try and get more of a generalist view in, in one of those. I would, I would just follow up that very quickly. There's a book called range by David Epstein that it's about exactly what Max is talking about. No. And, and it, and no, no. it gives you, yeah. Yeah, it's really good. It gives you like historic moments of people who have a large range uh, that have reinvented themselves over and over again. And those became the virtuosos of the future. Um, and so, you know, because you can't figure out how all these pieces come together right now, it doesn't mean that you won't. It doesn't mean that they don't make sense. I found myself in construction, literally in the construction site. And I was like, wait a minute, I have two masters. What am I doing? Like, like, you know, in the if I didn't have that experience, there's no way I could build what I'm building today in tech. I just couldn't because construction is such a big piece in the whole conversation on, on, on real estate. 
Uh, so just trust that you're exactly where you need to be and that's going to continue to happen. It's going to make sense at some point. Yeah. And I would say just to piggyback off um, both Max and Olivia that it's okay to not have all the answers all the time. Um, you know, there will be situations where you just don't know what to do. And that's, you know, for example, for me, that's where meditation and mindfulness and doing my Reiki practice and, you know, praying and all of that really comes into play. And it's okay if I can't answer it. Um, one day, you know, I reach out to people, I get, I let them know what I'm going through and you never know what they're going to say or who they're going to introduce you to. That might be the resource that you need to get that answer. Um, for example, like I'm going to buy that, that range book as soon as this is done. <laughs> Uh, that sounds awesome. Um, so I think that it's just trusting yourself and just knowing that, okay, this is a pivot. Like right now we're all pivoting. Um, at the beginning of COVID, that's what everyone had to do. And you see companies that are still pivoting, trying to figure out what they can offer to keep their companies alive. So um, it is a blessing definitely to be able to reinvent yourself. Just trust in the process because it could take a while, but you'll get there. Thank you. Um Mark has a question for Olivia. Uh, Mark says, uh, hi, Olivia. I noticed you have been doing a lot of webinars recently. Is that part of your growth strategy? Uh, great question, Mark. Hi. Uh, it's great to see you. Great to be in a panel with you. Um, so, not, so what we want to do is we've combined all the disciplines into a single software. So it is our duty or we feel like it's our responsibility to then teach the disciplines, every other discipline. Uh, so like I mentioned before, so the architects can really handle financial analysis. They could, you know, build their own ideas or go straight to investors. So the brokers understand the full spectrum of development, the, the zoning and so on. Um, and, and so we feel like these webinars, we're going to add another component, not just a webinar, but an, a, like a deeper educational component for finance and zoning and understanding that. Uh, because one, it, it allows more people to onboard, but it gives people really powerful tools to be more independent. And I think moving forward, the more autonomous you could be, uh, the, the happier you'll be. You know, everybody, you know, nobody wants to have a boss, but everybody will anyway. But, the, you know, the more flexible you could be with what you do. And this is specifically through the, the, through the real estate industry. Um, but I think it's, it, it works in any industry. So that, that's why we're doing it. Thank you for the question. Um, and Jess for Startup Grind HQ has a question for all. So if you look at your life five to 10 years ago, did you expect to end where you are now? And what did you wish someone had told you at that time? So back in 2015, 2010, where, where were you and, and what, what's that that you want someone to tell you? I was at an artist, I was an artist in an artist residency uh, that no longer exists. And um, yeah, no, there's no way I would have imagined. I had just come out of the DARPA program and I was trying to create software that seamlessly put information into your brain and had completely disregarded all, all the, the degrees I had in architecture and real estate. And I never thought I would go back to, to that field. And what I wish, so the answer is no, had no idea. And what I wish someone had told me at that time I don't know. I don't think there's anything anybody could tell you. Uh, just like this, it's a simple, simplistic, maybe even like just trust in the process. Just keep, you know, you'll figure it out. Don't stress. Don't stress. Just trust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll let you go last, Max. Uh, <laughs> don't. Don't spoil her. You're spoiling her. <laughs> um, so I'll start with what do I wish someone had told me at, the, at five to 10 years ago. And it was, I think a lot of people did tell me, but I didn't believe it myself. So it would be me telling me to trust myself and to like follow my gut and trust my instinct. Um, because I was very, 
uh, se separated with heart and mind. Like, oh, I need to do this. I need to go to law school and do this so I could have a stable job. It's stable, stable, stable. Like that was my thing and financially stable and stable. And I was like, okay, well, I didn't like anything that I was doing. Um, so did I expect myself to be where I am right now five years ago? So five years ago, 2015, I had just graduated with my master's. I traveled the world for, I did backpacking. I took myself on a trip. It was wonderful. Um, I actually had no idea where I was going to be at that point. Um, did I think it would be here? No, but this question is always so difficult to, at, to answer. I think it's like, how could you ever really know, um, where you're going to be in five years. Um, I didn't think I would go through a UX program. I didn't think that we would have coronavirus. You know, I didn't think about any of that. Um, so I, I didn't expect it, but I'm not upset at it. I'm quite happy with where I am right now and um, happy with where I know I'll be going. Yeah, it's hard to look back and be like, what, what I wish someone had told me, but I think if, if I had to think of anything, I, um, cause I give this advice now, I think especially for women and for women of color, even white presenting Latinas, um, we, for some reason grow up thinking that we're not enough or people tell us that we're not enough and we believe them. And I just feel like I spent so much of my life being, assuming that I only got something because I was, check, you know, and people literally said to my face, you probably only got this cause you checked off Latina. Uh, on some application and like you you just you believe them um, for whatever stupid reason and I wish that I had been more confident um, and I wish I hadn't been as self-deprecating because I feel like with self-deprecation I, I kind of made people believe that they were right about what they were saying um, and I t like people are always going to underestimate you and like why add yourself to that group right like why why should you be the one um, that also underestimates yourself and doesn't believe that you can do it? Like you should be your biggest champion. And I, I am now almost to a fault. And I feel like it's, I wish I had started sooner. Um, who knows where, where I could be, but I feel like I also, again, having the career that I did, which was kind of all over the place. I let, um, I, I kind of always, let opportunities kind of come to me and I applied for things and, um, and I took random jobs that just led to really interesting things. I felt like if I just, you know, worked really hard and, um, showed up and, uh, and met new and exciting people, then I would kind of figure it out. And I always kind of knew that I would be in some position where, um, I, I could lead something like I always knew I just wanted to I mean yeah I'm Latina I just wanted to be in charge so and <laughs> I am. Um, another question from Mark uh, how do you see tech addressing the second pandemic affecting America today namely racist racism I don't know if I pronounce it right sorry racism racism thank you um, so I think technology is a, a mirror of the spiritual world. I'll just throw that out there. That's a little weird, but it's true. Well, um, so the internet, for example, connected all of us and in the spirit world, everything's connected. And, and so I think in the spirit world, something that's really positive in the way I see it, this is, there's this great consciousness that, that we can tap into or not, but it, it exists. And, and technology allows us to have a higher consciousness because it's connecting all of us and we can understand how everyone is feeling in a way. Uh, so, so the ability for technology to allow us to mobilize and to allow us to understand that we're all feeling the same thing and that we all want things to change in a way that can't be stopped, uh, I think, unless you kill the internet, and I can't imagine that that's going to happen because then you the stock market is really going to crash then and so the ability for all of us to be connected and have a a, a unified voice um is gonna i think it's gonna have a big effect in the second pandemic and 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 i think that if we use it correctly it can bring real change um just like we've used it correctly without technology in the past and it has brought real change but now i mean this is 
really powerful what we could do together um, as a unified voice. So uh, I'm, I'm really proud of that and, to, and, and I hope that that's what happens. Um, I think I see a lot more wearable tech. Um, so consumer body cams maybe. Um, people, you know, being worried about what's going to happen next because, you know, the sad truth is that the only reason that these, you know, this is happening right now is because somebody recorded, um, you know, George Floyd's um, murder and, you know, things like that. And I think that consumers are definitely more or will be more um, attentive towards those kind of things. I mean, they already have been. Um, so I think that will be one thing as well as more apps uh, and platforms that will encourage and help with voting. Um, you know, I signed up today for election reminders, uh, just, you know, with like, like the local elections, because that's something I'm going to do to do my part um, and make sure I'm more involved in local politics and, you know, city commission and the town halls and all of those things. Um, I think that because most of the people who are out protesting and making movements towards um, creating change right now are younger people that there will just be a lot more technology used in various ways um, by them, right? Because like technology is, is used by everyone, but really the younger people latch onto it. Um, for example, I went out and I protested and the way that I found out about the protests were just from Instagram, from going on people's stories, you know? So I hope that social media and things of that nature, for example, Blackout Tuesday, um, all of the content changed just like that. And it was incredible, like just seeing the normal content that I see, it's a lot of music content, things like that, but seeing the people become activists and seeing people care about humanity was so beautiful. Um, and to know that we can make that change just by, you know, hashtagging something um, and finding some, some event that's going on near us that we can attend, I think that it's going to be a really big uh, movement as in technology. Yeah, not to end on a negative note, but I think technology can also fuel racism and we have to be really careful because technology is built by people and a lot of the tech is not the three of us, right? It's white men. Um, and a lot of the AI uh, has gone Nazi bot, right? Because when you train, I mean, we have to train technology. And if all that you're feeding it is is terrible things, technology can do terrible things. And if you are building things that collect data and you have no moral conscience and you are selling that data, uh, this is a big issue with facial recognition um, and, uh, and minorities. And um, I, think, I think there are a lot of positives to technology, especially with, a, with the pandemic of racism, because it has no vaccine. Uh, but at the same time, I think we have to be super careful about it and make sure that the people who are building it are the people that are going to uh, be positively affected by it. Yeah, using it in the, in the right way, because as any powerful tool, it can go in the both directions. Like my superpower could be used for good or evil. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, we are right on time. Uh, our event is end at 8. And I just wanted to give a huge, huge, huge thanks to you to accept my invitation to be part of the panel. It was a, a really crazy idea that I throw, throw to Mark like a few weeks ago, like, hey, I would like to host a women panel because I think it's needed. And it came right on time with our Startup Grind Women Month um, on June. So I want to thank you a lot for giving me this opportunity and your time. And it was an awesome conversation. I think we did really, really well. And thank you all for the attendees to hear us and giving, giving us an hour and a half of your time to, to share ideas. And I think this space is really sacred and it's very needed around this community uh, for women, for entrepreneurs and for for support ourselves and giving back, that's really important because success is not, it's not something that you, you, um, 
celebrate alone. So, so being successful means sharing it with, with people. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, also for, for your time and being here and sharing this awesome platform with me. I'm a new co-director for Startup Grind. This is my first event. And I'm very thankful and humble to be here. Thank you, you, thank you for putting thunder. this together. Thank you. <laughs> you stole my thunder. I was just going to mention that. I'll make the mission and I'll make the announcements before we go. Okay. <laughs> Are you done? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily, Max, Olivia. You guys are awesome. And this was a great conversation. Now I have a list of books to get, <laughs> a list of things to do. You know, I'm going to register to vote and all those cool things. Max, your candor is amazing. I love your, you know, you're just like fresh and, you know, and I mm -hmm. love that. I also want to recognize Vanessa. She's been doing an amazing job. She's a brand new uh, co-director, so let's give her a round of applause. She's official. Yes, and great moderation. You know, and it's our first event, like she said, so it's amazing. And, you know, we're going to see a lot more of Vanessa. And we're going to make sure that, you know, she hosts a lot more events. You know, I'm going to put you to work, Vanessa. Okay. Deal. <laughs> we're here to support you. Thank yeah. you. That's right. So she could not, we could not have gotten a better moderator for this event. And, you know, we're going to make sure that she gets an opportunity to, you know, show her skills and uh, participate in our startup grind community. And the last thing, but not least, is that I want to thank the audience and make sure to join us next, uh, next month uh, for the fourth installment of this conversation. And it's going to be about innovation. And we're bringing back uh, Oscar Arias. Who has, uh, he had an amazing workshop a few months ago and he's coming back and he's gonna teach us how to innovate out of crisis. So thank you again, everybody. And uh, we hope to see you next month. And ladies, I am bringing you back very soon. <laughs> yeah. That was amazing. Thank you so awesome. much. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, nice guys. to meet you, Vanessa. Nice to meet you, Emily. Thank yeah, you. same. Bye, guys. Have a good night. Night. Be safe.